Welcome to Shaping the NYC Skyline, the podcast that explores the stories behind the buildings that shape our city. I'm your host, David Chamshovich, and I'm here with my co-host, Brenda Slokowski. Hey, Brenda. Hey, David. How are you today? I'm pretty good. It's We're in New York City. The sun is shining. It's not, actually. It was actually <laughs> raining this morning. But the sun is shining right now. Okay, fine. Fair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nobody's going to care. The forecast is going to be completely different. I forgot an umbrella this morning, so I didn't appreciate the fact that it was raining. The first thing I do when I wake up is, Alexa, what's the weather? I forgot to this morning. I was just running late, and I just got dressed because I was like, okay, let's let's go on the move. And then I walked outside, and I went, damn it, it's raining. We have some um, interesting stuff to talk about. We met with... Who did we meet with? We actually met with Brian Ezra from Avery Hall. So Brian uh, was able to drag us all the way to Brooklyn. Yeah. Not drag us. I'm from Brooklyn, but no, now we kind it, of... It's like a 40-minute subway for me. Yeah. Not bad. Nice neighborhood. Yeah, really nice neighborhood. And I liked the, the space that he was in. It was very cool. Amazing space that he was in. We're not going to reveal it. Right. I don't uh, want to like give away his address like we gave our, ours away in the first episode. I think we want people to find us for some reason. Yeah, but like, don't come to my office. Like, Call me. <laughs> How many people have come to your office? <laughs> we have people. It's, this is like the um, TRL of uh, like we have people outside with oak tag and different, you know, saying, we love Brenda. They're all outside our window <laughs> on the 14th floor. Sign and shine, PC me. It's ridiculous outside. I mean, I can't believe how many fans we have for a real estate podcast. Wow. The uh, fans are, are going wild. <laughs> they're a little fair. Brian is, is an accomplished guy. I mean, he's, he's young, yeah. right? He's young. He's, he's really on a roll and he's been doing this for, for quite some time. What did you think he wasn't one of the most interesting revelations during that interview? I really liked where he spoke about how he chooses his properties, how he figured out where he wanted to start development. I'm not going to spoil it for everybody, but the way he went about finding his, the properties that he wanted to invest in and, and how to go about different programs, I really enjoyed hearing his like methodology for picking those out. Yeah, believe it or not, that's actually what stood out to me as well. It was very yeah. cool to see that methodology, uh, and, and you'll listen to it. I think he just used something he loved to then find find those sites and you'll you'll hear more about it. And I think that's an excellent way of going about it because he wasn't specifically doing it for that purpose, but that's sort of how it right. how it came about. It was kind of just his his love for the city that that made him expand. You yeah. Know? And he's he's a Brooklyn boy through yeah. and through many generations. He still lives there as well. And he's built a, a ton of properties there. He really did have a very succinct view of his company. I'm, I think that was obviously not on purpose, but it, it sort of came about because I saw those phases too as I was reading about Firm and seeing their development. And they had these three phases. And right now, you know, they're they're in a different phase that's completely separate from those first two phases. Yeah. So they have a real sort of trajectory in terms of how they how they're moving forward with the development process. And one thing obviously that didn't surprise me was <laughs> and I'm gonna spoil a little bit, but not too much is they're living they're, in New York. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're basically not planning on developing in New York from what it sounded like in, in the foreseeable future. Yeah, rightfully so. I mean, how can you when you don't have the incentives that have now expired? They've just chosen to do what a lot of other developers who have the means to do that, to go out of state where there are more opportunities and there are more abilities for investment in, in, in real estate yeah. and development. In the last few weeks, I've seen dozens and dozens of articles as the clock oh counts down, right? Yeah. I've not seen so many op-eds about a topic. Every single day, there are like three or four different op-eds about this. And it doesn't seem like anybody's listening. I think they're... It's falling on deaf ears, yeah. Well, they're holding back, I think, on, on good cause eviction. I've spoken to Alan about this. And they want to trade. They want, they want that good cause eviction. They want more tenant rights. And they're holding out. I think it's a bad way of negotiating. Yeah. Because it's still a huge loss. Nothing's going to happen. And then who knows where we'll be in a year. They're not even looking to, to extend that completion deadline for 421A. Yeah. Maybe we'll get it. Maybe we'll Indiana Jones it. <laughs> Indiana Jones, he, there's always a scene in one in any every movie where there's a door that's a really heavy door that's going down. Oh, and, and he, he slides, slides on the door there. and his hat falls off. Uh, and he grabs it at the last minute right before the door closes. Okay. Maybe the people in Albany will Indiana Jones it. Indiana Jones it. The hat here is the completion deadline. <laughs> I, I'm genuinely confused about how they think that development is going to exist without this completion deadline extension or even a new program. Like, 
How do we expect to revamp the city and solve our affordable housing crisis if you're not incentivizing developers to do so? I think it's going to take this year to see people like Brian and other developers who are now building in New York who are saying actively, yeah, we're no longer building in New York. We're looking for opportunities elsewhere. And then that's going to take them three or four years to do. They may not want to come back here if at, at all. And if they do come back here, it could not be for a while because they'll be busy with projects and states that actually support real estate development. Yeah. You know, another thing that I that I recall Brian saying is an interesting one, which I, one that I have been thinking about a lot as well is the bias against developers and thinking that their pockets, you know, they are deep and limitless, and and right. that viewpoint. So I, I think the these these sort of stereo types that's also causing a problem like developers are not limitless they're, they're in the business of making money but their margins of profit are impacted by these sorts of you know rules uh, right and then the limiting their ability to produce income and so there's listen there's no one side to the story as you will hear from from brian brian will tell his personal story and he'll tell a story of like the different phases he's gone through have sort of they weave a tale of what's happened throughout his sort of eight to 10 years as he's been principal of Avery Hall and how he brought in his friends and and what they contributed and how they undertake their process and how they divide their responsibilities. Yeah. I really enjoyed our conversation with Brian and I hope the rest of our listeners enjoy it as well. I think they will. Let's go, Brian. It's your turn to shine. We're actually in a secret location right now, and we can't reveal it. I know we told you where Side and China is located last time, but this time we're sitting down with a very important guest. He's a native Brooklynite, fourth generation. He loves to cycle and play piano. Hopefully that's still true. Wow. And you love space balls, right? Because that's one of my favorite. Who doesn't love Mel Brooks? It's History of the World Part Two, right? I actually just watched that Hulu show and it was great. Yeah. He got a BA from Tufts where my wife went. He also got a master of science in Columbia in real estate development. And my wife also went to Columbia Business School. So we have a ton in common. He, together with his two partners, Avi and Jesse, they're called Avery Hall Investments. But what do we call them internally? Is that the Beastie Boys of development? They are definitely the Beastie Boys. They are the Beastie Boys. <laughs> and if we had Sabotage, if we had the rights to Sabotage, you play right now, we'll talk to our copyright attorneys and find out. But we want to welcome everybody, Mr. Brian Ezra. Oh, wow. There's a huge crowd in this room. Every, everyone on this podcast should know that. Now, Brian, you become sort of a celebrity for me only because of all the research that I've done. <laughs> so I just want you to know I'm a little starstruck. Aren't you? Like when I first saw him, I first saw, thought I was looking in the mirror, but he's much taller. Much taller. What? How tall are you? I do exceed six feet in height. Not by much. That's a plus. But by a little A bit. lot of people think that's a plus. <laughs> I'm sort of interested in understanding like you are, you're a fourth generation Brookline. That's, to me, that's really interesting because... Nobody's from Brooklyn anymore, as far as I can tell. Where did your family come from? How did they you know, settle in Brooklyn? I've had family in Brooklyn since the late 1800s when wow. a master tailor from Romania that trained in London came across to the United States through Ellis Island, Jacob Gottlieb, around 1890. And he settled in Brooklyn and he was a tailor working in Manhattan, walking across the Brooklyn Bridge every day. And he did well enough to buy a townhouse in Park Slope in the 1890s. Smart smart man. Good (laughs) stuff. Smart man. And my grandmother was born in that house in 1919. And her mother, my great-grandmother, went to the school on the corner, PS39, on 6th Avenue and 8th Street in Park Slope, that my first cousin later attended in the 1980s, and my mother worked there in the 2010s. And they later sold the house, and the family grew up in Coney Island on my mother's side. But my parents had the foresight to return to their roots in Park Slope and buy a townhouse there in the 70s. And that's where my brother and I grew up, Park Slope. So Brooklyn is definitely like in your heart, for sure. Brooklyn is very much in my heart and in my mind at all times. So I was fortunate growing up. I went to a school called Berkeley Carroll in Park Slope. After I went to PS321, which is a great elementary school, still there. At Berkeley Carroll, they taught French. And I took quite a liking to French as a young person. And then my older brother had two Parisian French exchange students, two years in a row, 
when I was 13 and 14 years old. And I realized that speaking French was probably the most important thing you can do. And then later at the same school, it was my time to have a French exchange student, really awesome guy that I stay in touch with to this day, 25 years later. And that kind of gave me the bug. And so I studied French. And when I went to college, I had a chance to study abroad in France and was very internet, very interested in everything international and political. And so I chose to focus on that at Tufts University. And it was a great experience. And I would have it no other way. And I did share a advisor with Will Zeckendorf. So how about that? Also a Tufts alum. And moved to Barcelona. I was there for four months after college. And then I found my way in Rome and I was spending four months there and I was kind of dabbling in jazz piano and kind of other life exploits as a so young... Very far from the real estate. Very, <laughs> very far. Remember, I was 22 and playing jazz piano in Europe. and Sound like you're a Roma Springer from real estate development. Yeah. Well, let's just say I, I realized it was time to grow up and I found myself a job working in real estate in Paris and was an internship for Scott Malkin of Value Retail. That is Anthony Malkin's brother of the Empire Realty Trust family, yeah. the Malkin family. And it was an unbelievable experience. I have family in real estate. My father and brother are both in the retail leasing business, having worked for many large developers and brokerage houses. I've got two cousins that are very accomplished real estate developers in the mixed income New York City affordable housing space. And so there were some precedents for me that you could do this thing called real estate and that it could work out. And notwithstanding my dreams of international grandeur, I kind of thought that real estate would be a great way for me to interact with the world and found this job in France. And I got homesick and I moved back to New York and I got a job working for John Ustan at Midwood Investment and Development when I was 23 years old. And he took pity on me and offered me a job after he met my older brother. And after John Ustan offered my brother a job, and he said that he was happy with his own job, but I have a younger brother lost in Europe. Why don't you talk to him? <laughs> and I was 23. Did he know that you were, you were speaking on his behalf at the time? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. I think you know, it's an interesting time when you're 22 and 23 years old after college and you're considering graduate school or different careers or where to live. And it's not to say that one is lost at that age, but it's a time that you no longer have the moorings of society structures telling you middle school, high school, college, etc. You now opened up a universe of choices. And with that comes the burden of having to make a choice. Yeah. So, Did you come to that realization or is that something your brother? No, now in retrospect. It was something. But I think that being said, no. After a certain amount of time of not having a proper nine to five job, you know, and exploring the world, mm -hmm. it was time to get a real job and start to grow up a little bit. So you went, you came back to the States and you, you got this job. Did you get it lined up before you came back? Or? I got the job lined up over the summer and had to choose between staying in France and working in real estate or moving to New York and working in real estate. And I chose New York and started my career here in fall of 2004. What kind of things did you do at the management? Company? So I worked for John Eustan, Midwood Investment and Development. He has an extensive portfolio in the tri-state area. And I was a clueless young man. So he gave me a job, said, learn the business, be a property manager. And so for two years, I managed a series of office buildings, apartment buildings, retail assets, a little bit of industrial, some land. It was a perfect mixed bag. And did you find that one of managing one of those types of real estate was easier than another? Like, was there like one day where you're like, oh my God, I can't stand managing this industrial property? It was all pretty challenging as a somewhat clueless 23 year old and with the smart tenants and contractors figuring out how clueless the 23-year-old was. So there was a lot of education and it was an unbelievable experience. I think all of the asset classes were challenging. I think that the hardest one to manage was definitely residential. Right. That just comes with a lot of personalities. A lot of personalities and a lot of regulation. And that was interesting to see. But it, it was a great way to start my career. And when I learned about master's in real estate development program at Columbia, I became very excited by it 
and I asked for Midwood support with letter of recommendation, which they provided. And I went and I started auditing classes there and trying to find out who the professors were to try to talk my way in. And it worked. And I was accepted to Columbia and I started there in September of 2006. And that was transformative for my career. And that's where I met Jesse Wark, who was in my class, very talented architect. And we became friends first. And I met Avi Fisher, my other co-founding partner of Avery Hall, at my graduation as he was in the class behind me. So the three of us met at Columbia and it was an unbelievable real estate immersive experience where we networked with people from all over the world, all around the country with hugely diverse backgrounds, attorneys, designers, property managers, financiers, everybody was recovering from some element of their career and wishing to better themselves and become a real estate developer. So that was an unbelievable experience. And me. why is it you went from, you know, managing property? What sort of drove you to find this program in the first place when you could sort of just learn, you already had a job in real estate. Why not just let some experience? I was bit by the bug to create. And management is an unbelievable method through which to learn the real estate business. And I'd recommend that to any young person. And I have and ask me about how to break in and real estate development and financing. And I say, what about managing these buildings? Because that sure is a great way to learn how they operate and what are the constituent parties of the finished product before you learn how to create that product. So that was a great way to learn the business, but I wanted to build and I knew that I wanted to build. And the program at Columbia was a fulcrum point that permitted me to transition the first part of my career as a property manager into the more real estate finance, real estate development arena. And so coming out of Columbia, I worked for Cogswell Realty, which was then very successful with office repositioning and some large-scale projects in Newark. I was there for six years and learned a lot about the real estate development business and saw a lot of amazing things in the ground up and renovation space, commercial and residential. I made a lot of arguments to focus on Brooklyn in that time. There was some attention on Brooklyn, but never as much as I wanted. And it was a great experience. And Six years later, we did put together one project in Brooklyn at 345 Carroll Street with Sterling Equities. And when that project closed, I saw my window and a window opened for me. And that window was to leave and start my own company. So what was the signal for that window? What, uh... It was 2013. The world ended as we knew it in 2008. And it kind of stayed down there in some abyss till around 2010. Then the world reawakened and it started stirring again. And at that time, I was still in my 20s and still very much learning and still very much green, but learning. And 2011, 2012, the market really starts coming back and became more confident in myself and what I believed in and frustrated that I felt unable to pursue the projects that got me the most excited and that I had with my own inherent intuition, the most conviction about. And so turned 30 and the market was getting better and I was learning more. And with that kind of confidence, I was able to leave, start my own company focused on the place that I knew best and loved most, that being Brooklyn. So the, the stars were aligned, which often happens and this happened to me too. So I completely understand that. And that's, that's an amazing thing to have that breakthrough because not everybody does. You then, how did you pursue this dream of yours? Did you approach Avi? I know Jesse didn't join until 2014, but Avi's joined with you in 2013. How did that sort of come about? Avi had joined after Avi and I met at Columbia. We started going biking together. And so not like full spandex regalia, because you can also bike comfortably in shorts and a t-shirt. Sorry. And for distance. But we started biking together around New York, up the West Side Highway, out to Williamsburg, out to Coney Island, out to Fort Tilden, just wherever the good spots were, Tilden being amongst the best. Good to know. And we really had a good time and we became friends first. But then, of course, we'd talk about our careers and we would complain about what we were doing or what we wanted to do. And I told him what I was doing at Cogswell and I suggested, well, why don't you come join here? I think we might be looking for another guy to work on the deal team. And so he joined and we worked together for two years. We went through a lot together. We learned 
a lot about each other and how we were able to withstand various pressures. We took an unbelievable bicycle trip 500 miles across the province of Quebec. Wow. That is a very long distance. Unbelievable. Going to Canada. That's right. Brave. We flew to Canada with our bikes in a box. <laughs> we assembled them at the luggage carousel and cycled off out of the airport highway in Montreal. We then spent five nights in trucker motels and biked 500 miles up the St. Lawrence Seaway to Rimouski, Canada, where we took a train back to Montreal. And I would say a lot of great ideas happened on that bike trip. A lot of dreams were discussed. And a year later, we started this company. And Jesse joined shortly thereafter, about eight months, nine months later. And Jesse and I were playing basketball every Tuesday night on Court Street, Cobble Hill at International School because there was a Tuesday night game. And so from that, we stayed in touch and we would complain about all the things that we would complain about and get lunches and complain and brag and mostly complain. And he was extraordinarily accomplished with design and development and construction and working for major family, the Mac family, on some of their major projects. And there was an opportunity for him to come be a partner with us and we were able to do it. And that's why he joined. So when you're starting this new company, what are you looking for when it comes to your new developments? What's the first thing that kind of sticks out to you where you're like, oh, this is a property I want to invest in. I want to like start from scratch with. When we started the company, we had some basic decisions to make. What are we going to focus on and why? And why us? What's our value add? What separates us from other parties that might try to acquire or finance these target properties? So we decided immediately to focus on Brooklyn. And we thought that given my history and experience in Brooklyn and spending years kind of biking around and studying it and attempting to meticulously catalog it, not less than mentally, that Brooklyn would be a good place to start. We could have some advantage there versus some people who didn't know Brooklyn as well. We decided to focus on residential. Avi had a very strong residential marketing background working on five years of condominium development in Washington, D.C., before coming up. And then ultimately, we really thought about acquisition and rehabilitation of existing buildings, but mostly because of fear of the unknown of the rent stabilization law. We decided that we were not going to acquire assets. We were going to develop them ground up and that it requires a whole different skill set but then we thought that was the best opportunity on a risk-adjusted basis. We started on the neighborhoods that we knew best. I grew up in Park Slope. We were studying Park Slope, Cow Gardens, Cobble Hill, Borham Hill, Brooklyn Heights, Fort Greene, Prospect Heights, Dumbo. These are still the neighborhoods that we're focusing on and studying still in downtown Brooklyn. But we were looking for, we analyzed the market and determined that high-quality appropriately sized family living was an underserved market in Brooklyn. For these families in their 30s and 40s that if you're working in Manhattan or not, they've got one kid or another or a kid on the way or two and thinking of another kid, what are these people doing? Should they move to the suburb? Should they be renting an apartment? What's available for this cohort? And we focused on that cohort and created our strategy and started acquiring boutique condominium development sites in those target neighborhoods like the corner of Henry and Atlantic, which is uh, 325 Henry, the corner of Atlantic and Nevins through to Pacific Street, which is 465 Pacific Street. We assembled 145 President Street in Carroll Gardens. We're partners in 345 Carroll Street, which Sterling Equities developed. And so we built a business focused on middle to upper positioning residential condominiums in one to $4 million kind of range. So you mentioned partnering with Sterling. How do you choose who you want to partner with on the deal? And what are you looking to retain control of when you do partner on something? We have had many partners over the years for many different kinds of projects. We partner with different groups almost every time in some capacity. A partner must have a like-mindedness and they must bring a complementary skill or resource to a project that the other partner does not have. And I think, and there must be trust. 
So I think those are the successful ingredients to partnerships. And every partnership that we've done had that right ingredient mix at that time. Do you find that in these partnerships, you tend to take on a specific role? We tend to be the operating partner, boots on the ground kind of experience. And we're bringing the sweat and the effort and the game plan. And we're bringing a lot of the execution from a development design perspective, permitting, approval, zoning, assemblage. And we're partnering with other firms that often have a specialty in one of those assets. This are one of those kind of skill sets of uh, skill sets. And then often partners that have more experience and deeper pockets and more capital and banking relationships and longer track records than us. In particular, when we were starting off, we're 10 years in now. It's much easier for us to finance a $150 million project today than it was to finance a $5 million project nine years ago. Right. Yet this vision, did you have a magic eight ball of some kind? How did you know? Because no, I don't think anybody knew, but it sounds like you did. I think plenty of people knew. And it only simply made too much sense that all you have to do is spend a little time and walk around and ride your bike and go for a bite and talk to some people. And you would come to the conclusion that I came to which is that the quality of life in Brooklyn was being massively mispriced relative to the quality of life in Manhattan. And Manhattan was being placed on this unbelievable pedestal where Brooklyn's positioning was only that of a discount to Manhattan, which simply did not compute with my experience living in Brooklyn and going to Manhattan every day and saying, I don't like it here anymore. In fact, in many ways, I like my time in Brooklyn more than in Manhattan. Make no mistake, I love Manhattan. It's the center of our region. It is critical that Manhattan be a vibrant, healthy place with a vibrant, healthy, mixed commercial market. But just because it's the center of the region doesn't mean I have to like it more. And I simply experience Brooklyn as a cooler, more fun, more interesting, less intimidating, less intense, more accepting, more interesting place to be. And so why shouldn't the rest of the market see that too? Do you think that it's the opposite now? Brooklyn is sort of, to me, it seems like it's actually outpricing people from Manhattan. People are actually going back to Manhattan to find cheaper prices. Is that what's happening now, do you think? It's flipped. The market woke up. Yeah. When you get started on a project, I'm going to commit back to your development side. When you get started on a project, you start from like your idea and then build upwards. So where do you bring in, like, I know Jesse has the architectural background, but you're starting from scratch. What is your first step to try and figure out? We invest and develop thematically. So we had a thesis and a theme, which was for sale, high quality, family oriented housing in Brownstone, Brooklyn is an underserved, undervalued market. So we set aside, we set out to acquire and develop those kinds of projects. And we did. That strategy usually starts with me in consultation with Avi and Jesse and all of our partners, and it's iterative and it's constantly changing and evolving and growing. I would tell you now there's a very small chance that we would be developing any new condominium housing as we've transitioned thematically to the next part of our career, which is rental housing. I want to answer the question about Avi and Jesse. So it starts with thematically focusing on a strategy for a market or a property type or a size or whatever the strategy would be. I'll then canvas appropriately in that market with our team, focus on the ideal assets, what's available, try to make available that which is not available, try to respond appropriately to that which is available, and go after a project. Once we've underwritten it with our team, the market, the rents, the costs, the zoning, the financing, the basics, the basic level, we decide we like a project. Our next stop is Avi. And we'll go to Avi and we'll say, Avi, this is the project. This is the size. These are the features. These are the returns. This is the underwriting. We think this is worthy and this is why. What do you think? Let's say Avi agrees. We'll then say the capital. We're going to put in this much capital, but we're going to have to get this much debt and we're going to have to bring on these kinds of partners. Avi's mind is going and he's immediately structuring the projects and he's structuring phase one of the equity and then phase two of the initial debt and the follow on debt. And he sizes it and he tranches it and he makes sure that it all works together. So Avi's role is to organize, attract and document the entire 
capital stack and then manage it along the way and manage the risk and operations of the company. Our third partner, Jesse, does, as Avi and I say, what we call the real work, which is he performs the design, development, and construction along with his team. And he is a registered architect and an extremely talented recovering architect who realized that as a real estate developer, he could have more of a formative hand in creating the built environment versus architects who are still a critically important part of the process, but with not as much control as the developers. So that's how we divide our projects up. And that's how we divide our roles up and differentiate what we do. And it sort of came about organically, I assume, given the talent pool, you you guys had skills. It's just that we each quickly realized the facets of the business that we most naturally were attracted to by way of our personality and then our skill set. And so we each governed, we each grew, gravitated towards our own verticals and we have great trust in each other. And that has permitted us to scale, I think, a little bit more quickly than we would have otherwise. It, I thought it was interesting, the trajectory, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't have all the history, but I tried to do as much looking into it as I could. But I saw, I see two waves here of your development. I saw a, a big wave in 2016 and a big wave in 2019. Let's say we've had three chapters to our company thus far. In the first chapter, we were focused on boutique condominium development in Brooklyn. That was 325 Henry Street, 465 Pacific Street, 145 President Street, 163 Columbia Street, and then One Borum Place. One Borum Place was a transitional moment. In late 2016, we acquired a property in a brutally competitive RFP process. We competed and acquired that property for $76.5 million with a substantial partner that we've been developing a lot of condos with. We were planning to develop condominiums. It was still going to be boutique, even though it's a 250-foot tall tower, as compared against 11 Hoyt, Brooklyn Point, River Park, One Clinton, Fronton, York, and the other absolutely marvelously beautiful, completely amenitized, extremely large condominium developments in Brooklyn, we thought we could compete against them in a more boutique scale with 138 apartments. So we assembled that site, acquired the air rights, cantilever rights, light and air in an entire city block, designed the building in-house, got a $165 million construction loan, planned a condominium sales tour in China, Mexico, and Spain for February 2020. Mm-hmm. After topping our building out in January 2020, and then froze in March 2020. So then we pivoted. And pivoted. <laughs> Great. <laughs> that shows that you're savvy business people. We don't control the market. We pivoted as we needed to. So the first phase of our company was boutique condominium development in New York. The second phase was larger scale mixed use rental development in New York, in Brooklyn for premier sites. And the first time we were able to execute that and deliver to market was in fact, unfortunately, happenstance, which is one Borum place designed, financed, and constructed as a condominium in 2020 was converted to be a rental when we came to market in 2021. So that's a podcast for another day. That was a very successful execution of a condominium to rental plan. The condominium plan was never ultimately declared effective. The rental plan worked because we complied with 421A, now sunsetted, but in that time available. And 30% of our apartments became 130% AMI income restricted rental apartments, and the rest were market rate rentals. We transitioned in 2018. After buying one Borum in 2016, we took 2017 to pause and assess while executing what we wanted to do next. And our assessment determined that we should build rental housing, even though one Borum was still going to be a condominium at that point. And so, We said, how can we be rental developers in New York City? What is the competition out there? And you look at families named Algannon and Durst and Brodsky and many other extraordinarily accomplished families, and it's intimidating to try to compete with them on a standard project. And we realized that we never had a shot in hell and that the way in which we could be competitive 
It was with some smart land use bets. And the smartest land use bet at the time that we could think to take in New York City, circa 2018, was Gowanus. And it was already the area that we had been focused on, the area where we had been building relationships in the community with policymakers, with brokers, tenants. And so we studied Gowanus intently, created a strategy focused on large-scale land parcels under the theory that they would be rezoned at a time that the rezoning was starting to pick up a little bit of steam. And we wanted to focus on the upland parcels off the waterfront that would have benefit of proximity to future waterfront amenities without being without the imposition of the burden to actually construct and maintain those amenities ourselves. And so we, in 2018 and 2019, acquired the first positions of three major assemblages in Gowanus on Union Street and 4th Avenue, Union Street and Nevin Street to President, and then Carroll Street and 4th Avenue. And then we've been assembling those properties ever since and going through the Gowanus rezoning. And so this second chapter of our company, now we're executing on all of that development and completing one Borum. The second chapter of our company is becoming a developer of rental housing focused on larger projects, not necessarily boutique, but more like 100, 200, 300, 400 units at a time being a superior scale for us to work in. And so did you overcome the fear of not understanding rent stabilization? Because given that you have 421A and inclusionary housing mandatory, obviously that applies. We never liked the idea of acquiring assets with the goal of remediating the tenancy. We never liked that. And so our understanding of a lot of rent stabilization plays that you were seeing in New York City in that time that we were getting started, 2013, 2014, 2015, were a lot of the big bets to buy buildings with stabilized apartments and destabilize them. So that's entirely different than constructing ground up new construction, volunteering to build these apartments, and then building the market rate apartments. You're not forcing anyone out. So that just resonated with us as a better way to create this kind of housing. Do you find that you're looking towards the future? Do you find your new developments are kind of slowing down given that there is no 421A now? It's a major concern. We have stopped acquiring land in New York City. We're currently building 900 apartments in New York City right now. Between 25 and around 25% of those are affordable through the inclusionary housing program. We are not able to buy land in New York City now because we do not wish to develop condominiums. And the economics of land acquisition and development do not support market rate residential housing, well, sorry, any housing given very high real estate taxes. So until land reprices, real estate taxes go down, construction costs go down, market rents go up, and any combination within those four primary items, I don't know what we're going to do. Enter the third phase of our company. In 2018, at the same time that we determined that we wanted to no longer focus on building housing for sale, but rather building larger projects with housing for rent in New York City, and we implemented that strategy focused on Gowanus, on that neighborhood. We also zoomed out and said, what's happening in New York? 421A just expired in 2016. And it came back in 2017 after a lapse for a year. But we were still traumatized from that lapse. And we weren't even rental developers yet, except to say we understood that without 421A, we didn't know how it could happen. So we said it would be smart if we looked at other markets because of 421A risk, general political risk, the cost of doing business in New York City, the cost of living here. This was all pre-COVID. And so we looked around in a couple of markets in California, Philadelphia, and we chased opportunities through our network and none of them made sense. And California was too far. In Philadelphia, the rents were too low compared to the high cost of construction with union labor. And there's a gentleman in our office named Tarleton Long, who is one of the lead designers of One Borum Place in-house. He's from Charlotte, North Carolina. And our team was traveling to Charlotte regularly because the custom brick that we created for One Borum Place is created at Carolina Clay, this unbelievable brick plant outside of Charlotte. And so the team was going down there regularly. And Tarleton 
our designer, who had the instincts of a developer, suggested, why don't we look down here? Because I know we're looking at other markets now. And I said, that's a good idea. We started flying down in 2018. And we did that for two years, learning the market before we bought anything. In 2019, we started making offers. We did not get anything. It was entirely different underwriting, entirely different metrics, entirely different zoning regime, a new state-level government that does not permit inclusionary housing. It's an entirely different regulatory regime, and it's a different business and political climate. So it was a lot of learning. And in March 2020, we froze our building at one Borum place. In April 2020, we made three offers in Charlotte. And in May 2020, we signed our first contract in Charlotte. And we closed in September on our first parcel in Charlotte. We now have three projects in Charlotte for over a thousand apartments with currently 680 in construction. So the third phase of our company, which is now underway, is the point where we can transition. We love rental development, a good scale rental development with mixed use and ground floor retail, but now not only New York. And so that we should always be active in New York, but never only in New York. And never again can we tolerate to be exposed solely to the vagaries of the New York market. I think, I mean, what you're saying sort of resonates with us because we a lot of developers have had, taken the same position. And I think this is exactly what we were afraid would happen if 420 went away, which is developers going to different states somewhere else to develop. And that's sort of happening. We see, we've seen that track. And we are exporting our experience and contacts and capital in New York because we have positive response for many of our companies, investors, and lenders that we collaborate with on New York that are now collaborating with us out of state. And we're getting rezonings done in four to six months. And don't get me wrong. That's pretty fast. Yes. Everything is hard. Everything is hard. Nothing is easy. But we found thus far, working in some other markets, the climate can be a little bit less acidic. And developers are people too. And as you can see, you know, it, sometimes, you know, you get to a point, you know, I glossed over some of the uh, other deals we worked on in New York that had brutal approvals processes. And it taught me a lot. It's not to say that we wouldn't do it again. And we did a lot in Gowanus. And we can stomach a lot of risk, but I think that the some of the negativity around real estate development, many much of which is the real estate industry's own fault, but not all of it, and some of the demonization, I think, has been difficult, and it's been refreshing in other markets. It's not to say that there aren't people in New York that also appreciate people building housing, but it's been refreshing to go to other markets and see the attitude there. Thus far, it's going very well developing in those other markets. I don't know if you've heard about these zoning changes with City of Yes, or as I like to call it, City of Hell Yes. They're planning on these changes that will make approvals actually easier. I think it's to address exactly what... Have you looked at any of them? I mean, I don't think everything is available. I think they just the environmental changes are available. But do you have any intention on looking at those, writing letters or anything sure, like that? Sure. We look forward to hearing about more great policy ideas that New York City can use to encourage development. The problem we have is you could have a motivated city council, an energetic mayor, you could have a willing business climate, you could have all of these great ingredients. Unfortunately, in New York City, we are subject to New York State. And New York State, in particular, the legislature, with real estate tax policy and the ability to impose 12 FAR residential cap, that those instruments in particular are holding back New York City. I believe without a 12 FAR cap, there's many neighborhoods that would see additional development. I think that with functioning real estate tax policy, not to say I support or don't support 421A, I have no opinion about 421A one way or the other, simply other than it was an effective tool at spurring housing given our high real estate taxes. If there's another tool, I'm all ears. If they can reduce the real estate taxes and backfill it in another way, that's a great idea. But 421A worked, and there's no ideas for what doesn't work, for what comes next. I don't know how New York City can get out from the housing crisis without true partnership from New York State. And I don't see the alignment at the New York State level 
to motivate upstate legislators to care about what's happening in New York City proper. So until that's remedied, I don't know what New York City is going to do, notwithstanding a lot of great ideas, until New York State steps in and does something. Yeah, I think we very much agree. And now you you expressed it very well. And until that time, we are very busy in other states right now. We're acquiring land. We are actively in development. I think it does a disservice in New York where less supply comes and it's got a bad result for rents. It makes rents go up. So I hope New York State can take more attention to what's happening here to to work on some policy that can replace 421A if it's not going to ever come back. Definitely. Well, before we end up, of course, we want to say, is there something that you wanted to tell us that you didn't or... Do you have anything else that you want to promote or give us you know, some contact information if anybody wants to contact you? Yeah, let us know where everyone can follow you on the social if you or, or have social. To your website. Oh, my wife told me that I shouldn't have social media. <laughs> That's honestly a fair point. Is there a reason? <laughs> uh, because I don't know how to use a cell phone or a computer. Oh, no, You're but, the same book as me. Guys, everybody get on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, this is just, you know, I'm fortunate that, that my job is such a pleasure and that I get to do the thing that I love the most and that I can jump out of bed every morning to do it. And so for this, I feel extremely lucky and to have such great partners like Avi and Jesse. Yeah, we, we can, your, your enthusiasm is shining through and giving us energy. So we appreciate your time. We know you're a busy guy and uh, hopefully we'll see you soon. Well, everyone, that's our show. Thanks so much for listening. And of course, don't forget to subscribe. Also, don't forget to leave comments because we love to hear from our audience. Right, Brenda? Yeah. Feel free to reach out at info at sideandshine.com or visit our website at sideandshine.com. We really look forward to hearing from you. You could also reach out to David and Brenda at dshamshovich at sideandshine.com and Brenda Slikowski at sideandshine.com. You want to spell that? B. Slikowski at sideandshine.com. Those are lengthy last names. You can just find us on our website. That's right. (laughs) 